Namaste. A very, very warm good morning on this beautiful morning where we are charged with the sound of mind and body and the beautiful meditation. The entire topic of unframed itself is magical. The concept of unframed isn't it magical that it stems as a metaphor of art, unframed. So unframed gives me goosebumps. It makes me liberated because unframed is how life and how universe is. The entire universe, the entire nature, the earth that we live in is unframed. Close your eyes for a minute, let the glass ceiling go all but the dead, and imagine the sky. Look at the sky, it's so vast. It's a kaleidoscope of colors. It's completely unframed. There is no restriction. It turns magical in its diversity every moment. Every second, it turns into millions and millions of secrets unfolding with colors, with sound, with so much. Look at the universe. The universe is so vast, so huge, completely unframed. When we come to nature, when we come to earth, with all its secrets, the way a little seed grows into life, it's completely unframed. Every aspect of life, every aspect of nature, every habitat that we inhabit is unframed. We, as human beings, therefore, are the only ones who can put limitations on ourselves. So our challenge on this, in this life, I think, is to be unframed and absorb the rich experience of life itself and learn from the life the many, many wonderful lessons that all the experiences give. So I, in my humble existence, would like to share these beautiful moments which are great learning moments of my life. I was born, I would say, uh, as a single parent child uh, with meager beams and I, my mother was supporting us and I had to support my mother, get my sister married. So uh, I was doing tuitions, I was supporting her and I was doing all kinds of things in terms of uh, meeting life's demands while studying at Presidency College, while uh, studying at Calvin Boys School. All I could think of at that time was that the doorbell at that time was not was a new thing. And I wanted to have a doorbell. And the sound of the doorbell was exciting for me. When I traveled outside my house, I was surrounded by nature. So the most nourishing, the most mother and father umbilical cords of mine were from nature. So nature taught me as a laboratory that it is so, so amazingly magical that you can learn so much from it. It nurtures you, nourishes you. And therefore, I began to sketch trees and I noticed that the trees were cut. Even the marks of trees that are left, you have them lying beside you, waiting to unfold as poetry. And you can actually delve into it. You can actually go into the forms, the contours of, of the bark of a tree and find poetry in it, find sculpture in it. It's magical. Even after the tree is cut, even after it's dead, it still gives something to us. It gives us, it gave me my sculpture, my first sculpture. I was just out of college and I wanted to have my first exhibition. And it gave me my first sculpture. So when we look at nature, what is it that holds us back? Have we ever examined that we don't even live, as we all know, even 10% of our brain capacity? And if we begin to unframe the brain, if we begin to stretch our mind and body in terms of the vast experience that the universe offers, the limits are absolutely beyond imagination. So, how do we do that? If you, you know, wait, if you look beyond the obvious, there are so many things you can innovate, and it's from art as the nature of life, 
I am an artist, I create art. But this holds true for any stream, for science, for music, for poetry, for, uh, uh, for creation of inventions. You, all you have to do is look beyond the ordinary, look beyond what is not done, and you find magic. You find unframed life itself. So I started to explore different things, magical things which happen in nature, like rain, on trees, like rivers. All of it pouring down on you, offering several experiences. If you look at the thought experiment, and if you look at the limitations that you impose yourself on, you will find that the most important thing is to do something with whatever you have. In my early life, I just had one color. And if with one color, you have to create magic, you can still create shades. You can create a million shades with just one color. You can create magic with one color. You can create the depth and the perspective with one single color. So if you are limited, if you feel limited, you must unframe that thought and you must go beyond. You must take the imagination beyond yourself. I wanted to connect people and waters and rivers of the world. I wanted to connect the rainforests with light and color, which was my theme as watercolors. But I wanted, most importantly, to absorb the lessons of nature. And when I was going and traveling across different spaces as uh, the two years of corporate life that I led, I was always painting, I was always thinking, I was always creating. And therefore, nature has been the major source of inspiration in terms of how the first of its kind global public art project began. Now this project is not just about art. It is about taking art beyond art. It is about unframing art. Art is something that is not iconoclastic. It cannot exist in defined parameters of a gallery, of a museum. I wanted to open it up. I wanted to bring it to public. I wanted to engage it with people so that we can embrace nature. We can embrace architecture. We can do things with art which stretch ourselves, which unframe ourselves. So I had people coming and joining me to, in, in the process of creation. And when I uh, wanted to imbibe learnings of nature, that's how Earth was born. Earth as an art for Earth. Earth in Devanagari means meaning, wealth. What is the true wealth of us, of our life, of our, of our planet? It is the Earth itself. It is not the riches we accumulate, because all of it comes from the basic elements, the five elements of nature, of Earth. And therefore, Earth is about small truths and larger meanings of life. Earth is about clay, because we are all clay, dust to dust. I took rain. You've probably experienced chillum and you've probably seen it and heard about it as a source of intoxication for marijuana and ash. I'm saying don't do drugs, let's get drenched in rain. I looked at the earthen lamp as a small metaphor of earth. The earthen lamp is made by poor potters, it lies on the roadside and we suddenly pick it up and then we offer it to the gods as our prayers. We fill oil, we light a wicker, and it becomes sacred. And for that period, it's important. And that same earthen lamp, which has a humble existence made by poor potters, at that point, this whole dichotomy of context and perception changes. And after the prayers, it is again thrown back. It again goes into oblivion. That's how we use earth. In this quintessential existence of not even a hundred years, we explore earth as if we own it. And that gets me thinking. If we all, while doing what we are doing, I make art, but somebody could be a scientist, somebody could be a poet, somebody could be a dancer, a musician. You can, prof you can pr have any profession, you can follow any practice, but while doing what you're doing, if we can connect with the larger purpose of our life, if we can unframe our entire philosophy of life, then we take art beyond art, we take science beyond science, and we look at mankind, we look at connecting people. There is diversity everywhere, and in this diversity, there's this so, such a magical element of commonality. 
We offer the prayers uh, of, of lighting of lamps uh, at the Ganga River. And uh, in the three traveling trilogies that I that I been uh, in terms of connecting rivers and waters of the world, I found that this practice is also, you won't believe, you'll be surprised, is also followed in Minneapolis by ancient Indians and uh, the ancient tribes and uh, the, the uh, particular uh, tribes actually offer tobacco to the river as an homage because rivers nurture us. And just like in Varanasi, we have this practice of floating of diyas, floating of earthen lamps, and we worship the river, which is again an ancient practice. So when we look at ancient civilizations across the world, we find that in diversity there's this commonality of respecting the five elements, of respecting nature. And when we look at different cities, the mega cities, if we look at Delhi, before it was changed in its uh, entire architecture, it was beside the river. It was parallel to the river, drawing from the river. And then, of course, uh, when Newton's Delhi, etc., was made, it was made perpendicular to the river. So rivers are made to nurture us. Rivers are made to sustain us. And there is no depth of imagination that you can do when you bring that thought and when you want to stretch your art and when you want to do things beyond art and take it into public space. So I wanted to explore clay. After painting in the studio, um, my work was being auctioned by Christie's and Bottoms and uh, I could have continued to paint, but I wanted to take art into the masses. I wanted to connect with people. So in South Africa in 2013, I embraced nature, I embraced architecture, and took my river of clay. I took that earthen lamp, the first earthen lamp that gave me the idea of using it as a droplet of water. That metaphor of how earthen lamp was used in the quintessentially Indian process. I inverted it, I did a show on it, I inverted it and turned it into a droplet of water and made a small river along the entire museum, the national museum that hosted me in South Africa. And from there began the journey of embracing uh, nature, embracing architecture. So art does not need to intrude, it, can, it does not need to encroach, it can embrace nature, it can embrace architecture. So these walls in the India Habitat Center, I just let the, the river flow like mountains. And they were on the mountains, the river flowing down and into a valley. So the earthen lamp became my metaphor of experience. And we had thousands of children, we had thousands of public and people coming in and joining hands and talking about water. So that led me to the other experiment that I did, which was about connecting people. And in the uh, earlier practices where I uh, created this mural, um, which was again born out of the practice of uh, engaging with people, I tried to have different elements of not just the wall. You see, we had this five-floor wall on the, uh, in the corporate space, and this was a barren wall of five floors, which had uh, a circular building where 4,000 employees sat. And I could have, when I was commissioned to create this mural, I could have done that alone and gone. But I included 4,000 people to, in this participative process. I let them all come and join hands. It was a very challenging exercise. I had to come to the other side, map the, the uh, walls, which were the front and the back, and then I had to go back so that the entire tree of life was formed. So this practice, I made myself stretch, but stretch beyond the imagination in terms of involving people as well. And finally, we had the tree of life as the mural, and it had 4,000 people participating in it. So this process, I let open as dialogues at the waterfront in different spaces, in different areas, and in different dimensions. So we had at the mall, in the largest mall in India, I had the Beehive Garden with bees, with, with chillers. I had the waterfront, which becomes a bedrock of activity in different cities. And I had different performers from dancers, musicians, and uh, policy makers, and uh, all stakeholders of society come together to have dialogues at the waterfront in the riverfront that I create in the central space of our city. 
So I'm addressing this in 29 cities across the world, and the result is phenomenal. We have people coming in who actually join and who actually talk about solutions from local to global and back to local. It's a fascinating experience. So when you take art beyond art, there are no limits. You are unframing the entire experience. You can embrace trees. These are chillers. I'm saying don't do drugs. Let's get drinks to drink. And I'm creating beehives. Bees are a very important source of sustainability. So these beehives are actually chillers or this small intoxication element which is turned into nature and element of nature. The parts of life we take from Earth and we give back from Earth, the time machine. And the sound of home that I've created with three time machines is about A, U, and M. And M itself, when it ends, the sound of creation does not end. You take it within you. So there are no limits. It is unframed. The entire experience, the dialogues at the waterfront, nature as a museum of museum laboratory, is the mantra which I have tried to imbibe in the entire philosophy of my art. The city needs the river, we need trees. This is a project which I am taking across the cities of the world. And the experience is phenomenal when you engage with people and different stakeholders of society, and you have different things happening at the waterfront. So the idea of sharing it, the idea of taking your art into space is about how the sun shines, how the sun is so brilliant in its light that it shares that light. So if we can share what we create while doing what we're doing and take the message across to a larger, broader perspective of life, of the universe, then we have limitless possibilities. And we can take it beyond everywhere, everything that we do. We can take it beyond color, we can take it beyond form. Man and nature as an element of exercise, of engagement. We can take it as a new world order that we can create through art, through science. We can create magic anywhere, with anything. I was very privileged that uh, with Dr. Kalam, I was the first artist in residence. But we didn't stop there. We formed a dialogue of paintings and poetry and created a book which Penguin published. The Business Leadership Awards were normal trophies. We made them into something different. We made them as, as the form of a painting which can be given to the awardee, Mr. Kumar Mahmoud, in this case, and Mr. Kalam, so that we can have uh, a different experience at the award. So it's on us to change life through what we do. And therefore, the magic of unframed unfolds. I will end with a note saying, Faintly familiar images drove in slow motion, faces long forgotten, pressed against the glass panes. And some nameless thoughts disrobe in front of the mirror. Naked in darkness, they stand unseen but there. I move my fingers around them. They are the truths having come to me all the way to take shape and to be born, and I create unfreedom. child across the street is not going. So I was told that he is an underprivileged child.